Shalom and welcome to Jerusalem Studio. I'm Amir Oren, filling in for Jonathan Hessen, who will be back uh, shortly. And our topic again, uh, how surprising Iran and its uh, nuclear project. In almost every culture, one finds the equivalent of the old proverb, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, especially in matters of war and peace. It seems to fit the pendulum called the negotiations over the revival of the lapsed joint comprehensive plan of action. And the question is, is it on or is it off? And what does one make of the various moves in the Iranian nuclear program and by the Biden administration? To help us uh, probe the puzzle, we are joined uh, from New York City by uh, Dr. Oli Heinonen, the former Deputy Director General of the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, now uh, with the Simpson Center. Hi, Oli, how are you? Fine, thank you, and thanks for having me. Thank you. And uh, from Washington, uh, Mr. Jason Brodsky, Policy Director at the United Against uh, Nuclear Iran. Hello there, Jason. Great to be with you. Thanks. With me uh, in the studio, uh, Re Reserve Colonel Reuven Ben Shalom, who is uh, a cross-cultural expert and uh, a very experienced uh, strategy and military affairs uh, expert. Uh, Oli, Dr. Heinonen, uh, what's the state of play? Um, it seems as if uh, we are again uh, being faced uh, with a, a hare and a turtle situation where the Iranians are slowly but surely accumulating more and more fissile material. They are not crossing any visible line, but uh, if they uh, suddenly decide uh, to do so, um, they uh, will be a very short time and space away from achieving their goal. That's true. They have been accumulating uh, enriched uranium quite a lot during the last two or three months. Uh, as General Gantz said here in New York, they have enough fissile material that they can in a few weeks time produce enough uh, high enriched uranium for three nuclear devices if they decide so to do. So certainly the heat is on on the other part in our, how long they can tolerate this piling up of uh, high-ended uranium, or high-ended and ended uranium. That's one part of the game. The other part of the game, which is Iran is doing, is a very interesting. They sent answers back to uh, uh, Borelli regarding the kind of consensus proposal for uh, revised JCPOA. The European, European Union policy chief, yes. Joseph Borelli. Uh, and, and they added there a couple of new items, which certainly upset the card. But I think that they did it by purpose for two reasons. First of all, they know that here in the US, uh, this deal cannot pass the Congress for the time being. Biden administration doesn't want to make it an issue during the mid midterm elections. So in reality, they know that the parties will return earliest to this back in November earliest. And this is a time when serious negotiations again will start. And at the same time, then they did one more thing, which they have not done since the uh, last couple of years. They practically stopped any cooperation with the IAEA, which is related to this uranium particles found in three locations. This is unusual because they promised still in June 4th that they are going to cooperate with the IAEA. But they saw now that uh, there is no necessity and put more heat on that. And at the same time with this one, they make, made pretty sure that the IAEA was not able to make or board to make any tough resolution this week in the board. So all things went in a certain way to their favor, but the real game starts in November. Now, Jason, um, Oli uh, said that um, in November, after the uh, 8th of November uh, midterm elections, the parties will probably be back. And he meant by parties the Iranians and the Americans. 
but the parties could also refer to the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And um, we know that uh, administration uh, officials, uh, especially those conducting the negotiations, the indirect uh, ones, uh, with the Iranians in Vienna, if there is uh, a secret track, uh, obviously we don't know about it, that they have made the rounds of Congress, Rob Malley and others, uh, briefing um, senators and representatives about uh, the state of play. Um, what do you make uh, of uh, what may have trickled out of those briefings? Well, uh, Rob Malley is scheduled to uh, meet with uh, House lawmakers, and uh, that will be a classified session. And uh, this comes amid increasing frustration from lawmakers who are complaining that they do not have all the details that their Iranian counterparts have. Uh, just a few weeks ago, a member of the U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, who's a U.S. Senator, uh, was on Fox News saying that she hasn't been briefed on it. And uh, that's deeply problematic uh, regarding uh, the congressional role. And if the administration wants to uh, uh, get support for its negotiations, it's going to have to start by briefing uh, the relevant committees and those who are um, uh, most uh, interested in this issue. So uh, uh, with uh, Special Envoy Malley scheduled to brief, we're likely to uh, hear some reaction from lawmakers. But uh, right now, the consensus in Washington is not Nothing will happen until after the midterm elections. And then there's a real question here because the political landscape is arguably going to be more challenging for the Biden administration with the projected gains uh, by uh, the Republicans in the midterm elections, at least taking the House. And uh, we're not sure about the Senate yet. So uh, that will uh, make for uh, a, a very uh, rough uh, uh, landing for any revival of the JCPOA in Washington. But, uh, Jason, um, is the administration dependent on the approval of Congress? Um, obviously, they are not going uh, to bring it to the Senate um, as a treaty for ratification. They would like to have uh, popular and uh, political backing, but uh, do they uh, uh, actually need it? Well, I think that the administration will submit the agreement under uh, the Iran Nuclear Agreement Review Act, INARA, which provides for a 30-day congressional review. And uh, that will likely be the mechanism. It won't be a treaty. Uh, but uh, Congress will need to weigh in uh, uh, during that period. And uh, the the reality is, is that it is unlikely that Congress will be able to block uh, the Biden administration in its attempt to revive the JCPOA, but the actual vote uh, totals will serve as a message to the markets uh, of those companies who are thinking of con doing business with the Islamic Republic that uh, the uh, Tehran is not open for business as far as the U.S. Congress is concerned, and that uh, any vote which will meet with bipartisan opposition to a revival of the JCPOA will also showcase to the world that this agreement is inherently unstable. Now, Reuven, um, public opinion polls in Israel, uh, when they don't try uh, to uh, portray the uh, makeup of the next uh, Knesset, when they deal with the issues of the campaign, show that there is not um, uh, such a high interest in the Israeli public regarding Iran, that a very, very small percentage even point to it um, uh, as an issue which will have an impact on their decision um, whom to vote for. However, it does seem to be indirectly an issue because former Prime Minister Netanyahu is trying to portray it as a test of character for Yair Lapid and Benny Gantz. And if they are not uh, tough enough against the Iranians, or if they are too soft on Biden, uh, making uh, uh, life too easy for him on Iran. Do you see it as a real issue in uh, the Israeli political discourse now? Uh, fundamentally, Iran must be a, a basic issue for every Israeli because we're talking about a potential existential threat, right? So every Israeli, when you ask him, what are your top three concerns, right? In your lifetime, it should be a nuclear Iran that may annihilate my country. 
one of the reasons I think maybe it's not in the discourse now is because there's no difference between the politicians on the Iranian issue. I don't think there's any difference between Yair Lapid and Benjamin Netanyahu, even though their rhetoric towards each other tries to show that. I don't see any proof of that. I see on the Israeli side a shallow perspective of the Iranian issue. It always has been. Netanyahu, I think, made one of the biggest mistakes strategically in Israel's history, probably, in pushing the Americans to leave the deal and actually leading to where we are now, where Iran is a threshold state. Uh, but even we can, and I can argue there are merits to the other opinion, okay, but I, I will claim that it's very simple in Israel. Iran is, Iranians are bad. Uh, of course, we don't, Iran, nuclear Iran is bad. Deal bad, because it's doing deal with bad people. You can't do, can't do a deal with bad people. Basically, also because uh, if, they, if they are terrorists and they, they do all these bad things throughout the Middle East, they can also lie about a deal that they sign. In fact, I think they adhered to the deal before the Americans pulled out of it. And also, I think maybe Iran are negotiating this deal, like they negotiated in 2015, because they want to sign it. If they want to sign it, that means they right now their strategic calculation is that it's not good for them to push for the bomb. So the reason they're pushing for it now is probably because they're master negotiators and it's the right thing to do. I think we have to respect a lot of things the Iranians are doing. So back to the Israeli question, simplistic terms in Israel, no in-depth analysis strategically, and that's why there's no really in-depth discussion about the matter. Dr. Heinonen, uh, the uh, Trump-Pompeo uh, policy uh, was uh, named uh, maximum pressure. It seems that the uh, Biden equivalent is minimum pleasure. Uh, there's not uh, a whole lot of joy in what he's trying to do, but he's trying to de-Trump the policy and uh, bring it back to the old uh, Obama administration where he served as vice president. However, ever since um, uh, Trump pulled out uh, four years ago, and uh, the Iranians too uh, have responded uh, by non-compliance, it seems that the revived JCPOA is a mirage. The closer you get to it, uh, the further away uh, it gets uh, from you. Uh, are we going uh, to finally reach the oasis and see that, yes, uh, there is some water there for the weary desert traveler? Well, and we ex see. excuse my, my mixed metaphors. <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to predict the, predict the future. But first of all, a couple of words about this uh, Trump's uh, maximum pressure. You know, that was so thoroughly thought. If you want to do, make a pressure, it's not only sanctions which is needed. You need at the same time to get the international community behind you. You need to do the heavy lifting in capitals to get as many countries behind you in this case. I didn't see much of that happening. Some allies perhaps approved it, but in big picture, no. And the second thing is what was failed to do is that it was already known that Iran was in non-compliance with safe applications and in breach of some additional items which are related to safe agreements. This should have been used as a leverage in the IAEA board and the UN Security Council to push Iran. That was not done. This was not done by Mr. Trump and it has not been done by Mr. Biden. So. That one, you know, we need to keep in mind when we talk about uh, developments. And then there was one thing which Iran did in a very small way in 2018. Not to rush to the enrichment, but uh, wait, show patience, get to a high ground in negotiation and try to get support against the Trump, Trump's maximum pressure. And we see it was successful. They waited a full year before they slowly started to ramp it up, ramp it up. So we need to look and learn from these lessons which Iran has taught since uh, 2010 when the negotiations started, when we look to the future. And what is there? I don't think that they will dash anywhere. They wait. And if they want the, the agreement to fail, they make it sure that the other ones will call it has failed, not them. Now, uh, Mr. Brodsky, your own organization is called United Against Nuclear Iran. Um, are the nations um, involved in the uh, Vienna negotiations really united, 
or um, are Russia and China really holding the key uh, if they decide um, to be helpful to Iran and uh, break away from the rest for their own interests, much as they uh, signed on seven years ago because they perceived their interests at the time in stopping Iran from uh, going nuclear. Um, what, uh, what are the others? What's the West going to do? Well, I think uh, over the last year plus, the U.S. has succeeded in realigning the perspectives of uh, Washington and the E3, uh, Britain, France, and Germany. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, Russia and China are a different story. Uh, Russia has not been as helpful uh, as it might have been in uh, 2015 in the original negotiations. Uh, given the uh, war in Ukraine, Russia, let's understand, is uh, is also the subject of a, it's a maximum pressure campaign right now. And at the same time, it stands to the, see potentially Iran uh, be relieved from a maximum pressure campaign. Uh, on China, uh, China has been uh, importing Iranian oil in violation of U.S. sanctions, capitalizing uh, off of the lax enforcement of U.S. sanctions. And that has provided Iran a lifeline over the last year plus to stall, uh, make maximalist demands, and um, shorten and weaken the JCPOA while uh, attempting to ink its own form of a stronger agreement in the form of non-nuclear sanctions relief. So uh, I don't think that the P5 plus one is united. The U.S. and the E3 are united, but Russia and China are a different story. Now, let's hope uh, there's no uh, railroad strike and uh, we'll take the Amtrak uh, from uh, Washington to New York. Back to you, uh, Oli. Um, and the question is um, about your old organization, the IAEA, um, because as you said, it's a separate uh, issue, ostensibly, um, regarding um, what uh, the inspectors are doing, uh, regarding the additional protocol. Uh, these are, um, at least uh, nominally, beyond the scope of the JCPOA. It's a different issue, but you can't really separate uh, the two. How um, have the uh, agency and its uh, director general, uh, Mr. Grossi, uh, perform over the last um, few weeks, the uh, the last or uh, latest critical phase in the negotiations. I think that we should comment, uh, you know, the statements of Mr. Grossi, because it's not only what is in the question here, the JCOP, JCOP and or a comprehensive safeguards agreement and violations with Iran. It's about the credibility of the whole verification regime under the NPT, that is in the state. And we have to understand the strong statements of the Grossi also in the light of that. And I think he's doing an excellent job. Now the problem is not so much on what Grossi wants to do or says, but it's in the IAEA board of governors where these uh, various parties are not that unified. We have seen statements again from Russia in recent weeks that uh, one should not do any hard decisions in the board which will upset the apple cart for the negotiation process of the JCPOA. And this will be the tenor for next uh, three months. And so, but, but decisions must be based on consensus? There is no majority opinion, minority opinion? No, actually IAEA uh, board works differently. It's a majority decision to start with. Uh, and simple majority, but you don't want to go, board has 35 members, you don't want to go with the, to the international community with the split of votes, so you want to minimize those who are against the resolution. And if you can, you want them to perhaps abstain instead of voting against the resolution. This is one thing. But the good part of this is that uh, Russia and uh, China don't have a better right in the board, so they cannot block it. If all the other countries, these 33 remaining countries are for the uh, uh, resolution and pass it again for the Security Council as a non-compliance case, they cannot block it. But certainly they will block it in the Security Council when it comes there. 
But that one is also today a new game. Because if you block it in the UN Security Council, any resolution which is posted there, there's a new procedure which then refers the case to the General Assembly. And it will debate it there. The only problem with that debate is, and the resolution which comes from there, is that it is not legally binding, while the Security Council resolution is. But we have seen how effective it has been in the case of Ukraine, where Russia was left pretty much alone in a debate when it was in the General Assembly. They got support from Belarus, Syria, Eritrea, I think in some cases from Iran, but I don't think it was in, in, in uh, Ukraine recently. And then China perhaps abstaining. So then there were a lot of other countries which didn't want to take any position, but it was a tremendous majority which was uh, uh, supporting the tough resolution against Russia on Ukraine. So I would expect something similar to happen if this case goes to the General Assembly. But to do that, U.S. has to do a lot of homework in the capitals. But we have seen uh, regarding Iran that when uh, a resolution only called uh, for uh, Iran to cease and desist uh, regarding its uh, ballistic missile program, uh, the call went unheeded. So uh, if there's no enforcement mechanism, it's, uh, it's really useless. But Ruben, um, we tried to get uh, the devil to participate in this panel, but uh, he had prior commitments, so I will be his advocate. What's so bad for Israelis about the JCPOA right now? Yes, we hear that they can get billions of uh, dollars, which they can use to uh, arm Hezbollah and other proxies. But that they can get, even if they decide to sign on tomorrow, um, forget all the concessions they still demand. It's in their control. But if Israel gets an eight-year respite until the sunset clauses of 2030, and Israel can use these eight years to invest in its society and economy, and of course, uh, while its intelligence community and military still keep an eye on the Iranians and prepare for the worst. Why, why is that so bad? Well, first, you know that I agree with that. So I can try to analyze why most Israelis think what they think. Some of it is simply not reading the document. The first, uh, the first agreement from 2015, its wording, for instance, said that Iran will never, ever possess a nuclear weapon. In Israeli mindset, the narrative was there's a sunset clause, and it means that as soon as this deal is over, they can do whatever they want. That means this deal, right, is enabling them to annihilate us, just not now, later. It's, it's a license for uh, them. That's, yeah. It's not true, and also it's the, it's the wrong way of thinking, because anyway, what you sign now, you know, who knows what's going to be in 10 years? Who knows what's going to ha happen when leadership is changed? We saw what happened when the U.S. administration changed. So, yes, that's the kind of thought. The issue of funding is fundamental in Israeli mindset. Again, I think that is wrong, because the Iranians proved that even under strict sanctions, they don't reduce the amount of resources they invest in terrorism throughout the region. They have priorities. Yes, it will open up funds. It will maybe give them a little more leeway, but that will not fundamentally change. If we sign the deal now, it's not going to double the terrorism in the region. We have to respect the Iranians. They know what they're doing. They're not only master negotiators. They have interest. They're promoting them, and they're promoting them wisely. The defense rests. Uh, Mr. Brodsky for the prosecution. Um, a minute and a half for summation. Well, I think that we need to understand that there are sunsets that are coming very shortly. We would be re-entering an agreement that has whose broader architecture has already started to expire. The UN arms embargo on Iran expired in October 2020. Uh, then next year, October 2023, restrictions on the ballistic missile program under UN Resolution 2231 expire. 2025, the snapback sanctions mechanism itself expires. So all of these uh, sunsets are coming very close and very soon to a theater near you, and the international community does not have a strategy or a response as to how to deal with them, and that has been the problem, and that is why uh, there has been so much opposition. Oli Heinonen, uh, famous last words only for this program? 
I agree with Jason, and I think that we should use this golden opportunity of a couple of months break and negotiate a better deal. By the way, in 2015, uh, it was not only the uh, State Department, uh, Mr. Kerry, uh, which took part in the deal, but also the Energy Secretary, Mr. Muniz. And this time around, we only see State Department uh, officials. Uh, perhaps they have technical expertise in the delegation, but uh, uh, we haven't um, uh, seen it. Now, um, you know, in Jerusalem, there is already uh, sunset, so um, uh, we are uh, going to uh, have to close down uh, this particular uh, panel, um, we, and we will obviously revisit uh, the issue. For the time being, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Oli Heinonen, formerly with the IAEA, now with the Stimson Center. Thank you very much, uh, Jason Brodsky of the United Against uh, Nuclear Iran uh, Institute and Re Reserve Colonel Ruven Ben Shalom here in the studio. And we will be back with another issue of uh, Jerusalem Studio. Thank you and Shalom. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, said the prophet Isaiah long ago. In our time, these watchmen have been Israel's creative and dedicated military and security experts in and out of uniform who have joined us on TV7IsraelNews.com to share their stories and lessons. I am Amir Oren, the host of this special series. Please join us for this unique opportunity to get acquainted with the people who have been standing watch on Israel's walls. For more of TV7's productions and editorials, we invite you to visit our website at www.tv7israelnews.com.